Hi, welcome to More Orthodoxy. This is a channel dedicated to Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox alike. Today I'm joined by Metropolitan Callus Tuswar. He's a bishop and theologian of the Eastern Orthodox Church and one of the best known and most beloved Orthodox hierarchs and theologians in the world. He's held uh, since 1982 the titular bishopric of uh, Diocleia in Phrygia, later made a titular Metropolitan Bishopric in 2007. He's proven to be a seminal figure in my own spiritual journey and that of many others, so blessed. He was Spalding Lecturer of Eastern Orthodox Studies at the University of Oxford from 1966 until 2001 and has written popular classics such as The Orthodox Way and The Orthodox Church. Just to start off, uh, Your Eminence, could you tell us first a bit about your background? So you have a, an atypical and fascinating background for an Orthodox bishop. Um, can you tell us perhaps about some of the key events and movements that helped form you and the man that you are now? Yes, I'm very pleased to talk with you today. And first of all, to tell you a little about myself. I am entirely English and I was brought up in the Anglican Church in this country. When I was 17, I had what was probably a turning point in my life. The most important single experience, I went inside the Russian Orthodox Church in London, which at that time was near Victoria Railway Station. And this was on a Saturday afternoon, and the vigil service was in progress. And I remember going into the church, which was a former Anglican church, my first impression was this building is entirely empty because there were no pews. All I could see was a large expanse of polished floor. But then I realized the church was not entirely empty, that there were icons on the walls with lamps in front of them, that at the east end there was an icon screen, again with lamps burning, Mm -hmm. And that there were a few uh, worshippers, not very many, standing, most of them near the walls, and some were out of sight. There was a choir singing. And then I had a feeling entirely contrary to my initial feeling. Instead of my sense that the church was empty, I had an overwhelming conviction that the church was full, full of invisible worshippers, full of persons whom I could not see, but I could feel their presence. And I had the conviction that we, this small congregation on Saturday afternoon, were being taken up into an action far greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. I had the conviction that along with us, the visible congregation, there are the saints praying with us, the angels praying and watching over us, the Mother of God praying for us, and indeed Christ himself blessing us. I had a sense that this service that I was taking part in was heaven on earth, that there was no division between the world above and the world below, that we were being taken up into the worship of the total church, the church in heaven as well as on earth. And it was that conviction of the act of worship which I attended as heaven on earth, which drew me to the Orthodox Church. And in that sense, it altered my whole life. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so I think that definitely comes across in your work and whenever you write about tradition and how it's a, the, the spirit is living through the tradition rather than some dead and stagnant thing. I think that's one of the great um, virtues of your work for me and I'm sure many other people do. Um, you've also introduced a lot of English speaking people to the church and people like myself who never grew up with any real knowledge of the Orthodox Church. Um, why is the English-speaking orthodoxy so important, do you think? And um, 
what sort of distinct role does it have to play for the wider church? I believe that the Orthodox Church is the one true Church of Christ. I recognize that the Holy Spirit is at work among non-Orthodox Christians, and I certainly don't favor an aggressive proselytism attacking other Christians, not at all. Um, but I do believe that in Orthodoxy alone, there is the fullness of the Christian faith. And I would emphasize the word fullness. I'm not denying the presence of Christ to the Holy Spirit among other Christians, but I believe that in all humility, despite our human failings, we Orthodox uh, are members of the true Church of Christ, which has preserved the living tradition of the Church in its full integrity. And in that sense, I believe that Orthodoxy is a faith for everyone. Doesn't mean we're going to attack other Christians, um, but I would still say those who wish to join the Orthodox Church, the door is open, you are welcome. Amazing, thank you for that. So um, then back to your own life as it were, is there any person or persons that have been especially inspirational or influential for you um, that you'd like to tell us about? Yes, first of all, I would like to mention two people who influenced me before I became Orthodox. They were Anglicans, and I was Anglican at the time. They were members of the Anglican religious community known as the Society of St. Francis. Father Algy, who was uh, one of the heads of the SSF, and his pupil and disciple, Brother Peter, and both of them, whom I got to know when I was around 17, six, um, both of them influenced me very deeply, and it was from them that I first learned about the Catholic tradition within the Anglican Church, and under their guidance, I began to go much more regularly for Holy Communion, and I learned to go to confession. So though eventually I left the Anglican Church and joined the Orthodox, I still remember the two of them as persons who introduced me, not only through their teaching, but through their personal example, to what we could call in the broad sense, the Catholic tradition of the Christian church. But then after I became Orthodox, I was considerably influenced by my spiritual father, who was a Russian priest. I myself became Orthodox in the Greek cathedral in London under the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Mm -hmm. But the bishop who received me sent me to a Russian priest for my spiritual father, and he was uh, Father George Shedemetyev, who was at the Russian church outside Russia, the exile church uh, in London. Um, he died a good many years ago, but certainly I owe him a great debt for his guidance, his personal love towards me during my early years as an Orthodox. Another Orthodox who has greatly inspired me is Father Amphilochios of Patmos, who was recently glorified as a saint. I was sent to Patmos by the Greek Archbishop Athenagoras, um, and I there joined the monastery. I lived for about a year in the monastery before returning to Oxford to teach. And there I got to know Father Amphilochios, who had been abbot 
of the monastery of Patmos of St. John, but uh, he had been uh, driven out by the Italians. This would have been in the 1930s when the Greek islands were under Italian occupation. And in his later years, he lived um, in a monastery for women that he had founded, which was also on the island of Patmos, mm -hmm. but about 20 minutes walk away from the main monastery. And I used to go and see him. So he, along with Father George Sheremetyev, are two people who have had a lot of influence upon me. Amazing. Memories people I've mentioned are all members of the clergy. But <laughs> also there have been lay people also who have played a part. Marvellous. Thank you for that. So um, then regarding your own works and endeavours, is there anything that you have been involved in that you think has borne particularly rich fruit? And um, why do you think the, those things have had such a positive impact? I'm now 85, and so at this point in my life, I sometimes look back on the past. <laughs> and looking back, I can see that there have been three areas in which I've been particularly occupied with, um, closely related and indeed overlapping. First of all, for 35 years, I was a teacher, in the University of Oxford. I taught Eastern Orthodox studies as a member of the theology faculty. And I worked in particular with graduate students who were preparing their doctorates. So that was my first area. I gave lectures as well, um, of course, in the university, mm -hmm. but um, then there's a second area, and that would be as a writer. You've mentioned two of my books, more popular books that have had a wide distribution. My Penguin book, The Orthodox Church, and then my later book, The Orthodox Way. But alongside those and other books, I've been particularly occupied with two tasks during my life. And that first was the translation of the Orthodox service books, the liturgical books of Orthodoxy. I worked on translations with an Orthodox nun, a Scottish background, Mother Mary, and three volumes of translations have appeared on which we collaborated. The Festal Mineon, the Lenten Triodion, and the supplementary texts of the Triodion. So that occupied a lot of my time during the past decades. And the second area in which I've been very much occupied, literary work, has been the English translation of the Philokalia. The Philokalia, as no doubt you know, is a collection of orthodox, ascetic and mystical writings collected in the 18th century by Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain and Saint Macarius of Corinth. A partial translation into English of the Philokalia appeared back in the 1950s, but I have been involved in a translation which has been going on since the 1970s of the complete Greek Philokalia, translated directly from the Greek. I have collaborated with two others, Orthodox friends, Gerald Palmer and Philip Sherard. We produced four volumes out of five of our English translation. The fifth volume, which has been much delayed because my two colleagues, uh, Gerald Palmer and Philip Sherrard, have both died and I alone remain. And because of I've been distracted with other tasks, 
uh, it's taken me some time to complete this, but the fifth volume is now entirely ready and I hope will come out uh, next year. That will complete the English translation of the Greek Philokalia. So those are the two main areas on which I've worked. Wonderful. Then I've mentioned two areas so far of my life, uh, university teaching and uh, writing and translating. But a third area is that for most of my life, I have been a parish priest. When I returned to Oxford in 1966 to teach in the university, I was deputed by the Greek Archbishop of Thyatira and Great Britain, Athenagoras II, to start a Greek parish in Oxford. There was already a Russian parish, and we in the Greek parish worked closely with them and continue to do so. So for a great many years, I was, in addition to being a university teacher, a parish priest. And that took up a lot of my time, more than I had expected. But looking back on it, I recognize that usually I would have spent up to 30 hours each week on my parish work. So that was a third area as a parish priest celebrating the liturgy, preaching, and I spent a lot of my time uh, hearing confessions. Now I don't do that very much. And now, of course, I am retired from being parish priest. I've handed over to Father Ian Graham, who was my assistant for many years, and he's now in charge. So that was the third area on which I worked. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And so just back to a few of those academic works that you have completed. Uh, I think um, the Orthodox Church, which we mentioned, is perhaps maybe the, the classic introduction in the English language. I was wondering, um, why, do you, why did you think it was so important to write it? And why do you think it has kept such a, a, a wide appeal after all these years? I did not take the initiative. <laughs> I was invited to write it. Mm -hmm. The publishers, Penguin Books, back in the late 1950s, planned to publish a series of books about uh, different branches of the Christian church and indeed on non-Christian faiths. And somebody gave my name to Penguin Books. So they wrote to me and out of the blue, and they said, would I like to write a book to be published in uh, the series that they were uh, initiating um, in what were then known as Pelican books mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the Orthodox Church. I was still in my 20s at that time, and I'd only been Orthodox for quite a short time, and my initial reaction was, I cannot possibly do that. I'm certainly not qualified to write such a book. But a friend of mine, who had a lot of influence on me, a fellow English Orthodox, uh, Bill Grisbrook, he said to me, you have not taken the initiative. They've invited you. Why don't you accept the invitation and see what you can do? And I took his advice, and the result was that first I wrote two or three specimen chapters, and then penguins were quite pleased with that, and so I wrote the whole book, and it was duly published in 1963. I never imagined that some 55 or more years after its publication, it would still be in print. Mm -hmm. In fact, since its publication in 63, it's never been out of print. And from time to time, I have revised it, 
um, a friend of mine said uh, that it was an old war horse beginning to show its age um, not long ago. Well, uh, that may be so, but I've tried to keep it up to date, but I haven't substantially rewritten it. After all, uh, if I want to say something different, I'll write another book. Mm -hmm. So that is the story of why I came to write this book on the Orthodox Church, something I would not have done on my own initiative, but there was a response to it that far exceeded my expectations. Marvellous. Uh, well, I'm glad you were invited to write it, and uh, it's one of my favourite books. So, um, much less known, perhaps, is, pardon my pronunciation if I get this wrong, Astratio Sargenti, a study of the Greek uh, church under Turkish rule. I was wondering um, if you could tell us some important points about the church under Turkish rule and what compelled you to write this book or how that came about. Yes, you are referring to a book on a Greek theologian of the 18th century, Evstratios Argenti, and uh, it had as a subtitle, uh, Study of the Greek Church under Turkish Rule. Now again, I came to write that book as a result of an invitation. It was published just one year after my Penguin book in 1964. A descendant of this 18th century Greek theologian, a historian, Philip Argenti, had written many books about his native island, Chios, and he was interested in seeing a book about his ancestor, Efteratios Argenti. But he himself was a historian, not a theologian. And so he wanted somebody who was a theologian to write this study, and he invited me. So that was my second book, like after my first book on the Orthodox Church, my Penguin book. And that was much more specialized. It was published by the Oxford University Press. Um, it's been reprinted and indeed it, there's a new edition by the American publisher Whip and Stock and it has a new introduction. So rather to my surprise that work also remains in print. Argenti, if Stratios Argenti was a polemical writer, most of his works are attacks on the Roman Catholic Church. So one might think that uh, it was a slightly negative area, but I combined it with a study of the more general situation of orthodoxy under Ottoman rule. And so in that way, I tried to put him in his historical context. And I found that though he was polemically writing against the Roman Catholics, yet he had many positive things to say. So mm -hmm. I enjoyed his company. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Do you think there are any um, lessons that are still relevant and that people need to know about the, the church under Turkish rule today? As it were. Yes. The most impressive factor about the Orthodox Church under Turkish rule was its faithfulness. The Turkish rule lasted well from 1453, the fall of Constantinople, up to 1821, the beginning of the Greek War of Independence. And indeed, much of the Greek Orthodox world came under the Ottoman Turks before 1453, and much of it remained under Turkish rule after the establishment of the state of Greece. So the experience of living under Turkish rule has deeply marked the story of Greek Orthodoxy. Now, the attitude of the Ottoman authorities from the 15th century uh, onwards, and indeed before the 15th century, 
was to tolerate Christianity. The normal view of Muslims uh, towards Christian faith is that the Christians are people of the book, that is to say of the Bible, and of course the Muslims honor the Old Testament, uh, but they regard the Christian faith as defective because we don't accept uh, Muhammad as our prophet. But this meant that in the Ottoman period, the Christians were tolerated, but they were second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. They were in a position of disadvantage. They were allowed to worship, but under many restrictions. And uh, one particular thing was that any act of conversion from Christianity to mm -hmm. Islam, uh, from Islam to Christianity was absolutely forbidden. Mm -hmm. And uh, the long series of new martyrs, uh, in most cases, it was precisely because they had in this way converted from Islam to Christianity. And in this way, what is impressive about the Orthodox under Turkish rule is their faithfulness, despite the many pressures put upon them, mm -hmm. despite every encouragement to convert from Christianity to Islam, the great majority of the Greek Christians remained faithful to their Christianity, did not abandon their faith. Mm -hmm. So that this is to be the most impressive uh, feature of orthodoxy under Turkish rule. It was under many restrictions. It was not a period of particularly impressive theology, but the Greeks did not abandon their faith. There were many martyrs, there were saints. There was a continuing practice of the traditions of the spiritual life of orthodoxy, such as the Jesus prayer. And so this is what impresses me most of all, that the Greeks did not abandon their Christian faith. Excellent. Thank you. So um, you've already mentioned the Festival Meneon. Uh, for those who are unsure, what is the Festival Meneon and um, why are books like this so important for the faithful of the church? Yes. Uh, the service books that Mother Mary and I translated together and came out in three large volumes. Uh, were first of all the Festum Ineon, and this is the texts for the nine great feasts which fall on fixed dates in the church calendar. There are some feasts which depend on the date of Easter and they move about, but there are other feasts such as Christmas and the Annunciation which always come on the same date each year. So the Festal Mineon contains the texts for the nine great feasts that are fixed. And the principle on which Mother Mary and I worked was to translate the liturgical texts in full. The Orthodox Church services, as you will know, are extremely long and complex. <laughs> but they are only done in their fullness in certain monasteries. However, Mother Mary and I thought we will not just publish a selection of texts, but we will translate the full range of the special texts for each of these feasts. And what is used in parishes will depend on the practice of those parishes, perhaps monasteries will want to use the whole texts. Now, our faith as Christians is expressed above all through our prayer. And alongside private personal prayer, there are the liturgical services of the church. It seemed to us, Mother Mary and myself, essential 
that these texts should be made available in their integrity. There were partial translations before and some rather unfortunate translations by people whose knowledge of the English language was, let us say, defective. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we wanted to produce translations which we hoped would be uh, accurate and also in good English. And we wanted to uh, translate the texts in their integrity so that parishes could use what they needed, monasteries could use the whole range if they wanted, but it seemed to us essential that English-speaking Orthodox should have access to the liturgical prayer of the church mm -hmm. because Christianity is a liturgical religion, our prayer is expressed through our worship, and therefore we hope that this would be a contribution to the life of the ever increasing number of English speaking Orthodox. God willing, thank you for that. So um, you've mentioned your Anglican upbringing and some of those influences, including the Anglicans that helped form you. Um, you've also written many years ago a book on the Anglican Orthodox dialogue and have been involved in certain different discussions and so forth. Uh, what were some of the key issues between Anglicans and Orthodox uh, many years ago and then how have they developed since then to today? I was indeed for many years a member of the International Commission for dialogue between the Orthodox and the Anglicans. Indeed, for part of that time, I was the theological secretary on the Orthodox side. And I learned many things from this dialogue, as well as forming with both Orthodox and Anglican fellow delegates, a number of valuable friendships. To me, the most elusive but also difficult thing from the orthodox viewpoint is the comprehensiveness of Anglicanism. Mm -hmm. In the Anglican communion there are many different points of view. The high church Anglicans are very close to the orthodox. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if the Anglican Church consisted only of High Church Anglicans, it would be an easy thing for us to unite. But as we know, within Anglicanism, there are also evangelical uh, Anglicans who are basically Protestant in their approach, who are influenced by Lutheranism and Calvinism, and indeed, in the last 50 years, the evangelical influence in the Church of England has greatly increased. And in the third place, alongside the high church and the low church, the evangelicals, there are also the liberal Anglicans, mm. uh, those Anglicans who call in doubt many of the fundamental teachings of the Christian faith, mm -hmm. such as the Godhead of Jesus Christ, and his bodily resurrection. Now, with the evangelical Anglicans, we often have friendly relations, but of course, they do not share our view about the sacrament of the Eucharist, that it is the true body and blood of Christ, not merely an icon, but the very true body and blood. And of course, they also would not agree with the veneration that we show towards the Mother of God and the saints, the way we ask them to pray for us, the way we pray for the departed, and uh, the use of icons. All these things, of course, would uh, not be acceptable to the Anglican, uh, to the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And therefore, with the evangelicals, for all our friendly contacts, there are obvious differences. And the liberal Anglicans who call in doubt fundamental teachings of the Christian faith, with them we sympathize 
with their sincerity, but we cannot agree with the conclusions that they draw. So this, I think, is the most difficult element in the Anglican Orthodox dialogue. And this is what makes the dialogue so elusive, that for more than a century, the Orthodox have had friendly contacts with the Anglicans, and yet no reunion has come about. The extreme diversity of viewpoints within Anglicanism. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, just to return to uh, something we mentioned previously, the Philokalia, um, I was wondering why do you think it has played such a seminal role in Orthodox history and theology and why are some of the sacred places that are set aside, such as Magathos, still so important for the church? The influence of the Philokalia since its first publication in 1782 is indeed astonishing. The Philokalia contains, as I've mentioned, uh, ascetic and mystical texts from a variety of authors from the uh, fourth to the 15th century. All of them with one exception were Greeks. And the Greek Philokalia of 1782 publishes these texts in the original Greek and without commentary or explanatory notes just with very brief introductory comment, uh, notes on each author. Now, by the 18th century, the Greek language had changed a good deal from what it had been in early Christian and Byzantine times. And the original text, therefore, of these Greek writings would have been quite difficult for people to understand. But except for a few texts uh, in the Philokalia, everything is given in the original early Christian and Byzantine Greek, which would certainly have been difficult to understand. And in that way, one might have thought that the Philokalia would have a limited effect. And indeed, more than a century passed before the Greek Philokalia was reprinted um, at the end of the 19th century. And a third edition of the Philokalia in Greek did not appear until after the Second World War in the years 1957 onwards. So one could not say that in Greek, the Philokalia was entirely a bestseller. But there's a different story when we look at the Slavonic world. Quite early, the Philokalia, or parts of it, were translated into Slavonic. And then in the 19th century, uh, an edition was produced in five volumes in Russian. And this was, Russian edition was reprinted a number of times, and it had a popularity far greater than that of the Greek Philokalia in the Greek world. What is more, since the Second World War, translations of the Philokalia in whole or in part have begun to appear in all kinds of other languages, not only in English, but in French, German, Italian, Finnish, Arabic, and other languages, Romanian certainly. So that since the Second World War, the Philokalia has come to be far more widely distributed. Next then, if we might look at the Orthodox way, which was obviously very um, well received by many people. I was wondering about um, this book, what it introduces us to some of the distinct features of Orthodoxy that people might not, still might not know. Um, what are some of the key distinct, key distinct features of orthodoxy that you think are important and that you think we can share with people? The fundamental theme in my book, The Orthodox Way, is the relationship between 
theology and prayer. I tried to show how the Orthodox faith is not just a set of doctrines to be understood in part by the reasoning brain, but that it is a way of prayer. And that if you divorce the Christian doctrines from the practice of prayer, the whole thing becomes distorted. So this was the basic idea behind my book, The Orthodox Way, to show how Orthodox Christian faith is expressed in Orthodox prayer. Therefore, along with the text that I myself had written, I included many extracts from different Orthodox spiritual writers. So this was the fundamental theme to show how theology and prayer are essentially linked and that each presupposes the other. Beautiful. I think uh, to your other book, The Power of the Name and um, the Role of Jesus, the Jesus Prayer in Orthodox Spirituality brings us across beautifully. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the Jesus Prayer and why it's so central to Orthodoxy. The Jesus Prayer, the short invocation to Christ under his human name Jesus, which usually takes the form uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, but there are many variants. This short invocation addressed to Christ under his name Jesus has played a very important part in orthodoxy. Its origins go back to the fourth century and even earlier, but probably the Jesus prayer is being used today by more people than was ever done in the past. Now, prayer is a personal matter, and therefore there is personal freedom in prayer. We do not say in the Orthodox Church that there is only one way of praying. Um, I do not say that Jesus' prayer is the only way of praying, nor do I say that it is uh, necessarily the best way. I would merely say that I myself have used it ever since I became Orthodox and before that, and that it has benefited me very greatly, and perhaps it would benefit you as well. So, yes, why does the Jesus Prayer appeal to people? It is short and simple. It does not require any special knowledge, any elaborate preparation. If anyone is interested in practicing the Jesus Prayer, one can say to them, simply begin. And then the prayer itself will show you the path you are to follow. So I think that the fact that it is short and simple appeals to very many people, particularly perhaps today, which is an age of anxiety and distraction, when many people find it very difficult to allow for a place of silence in their life. Because the Jesus Prayer is so short and simple to use, it is particularly appropriate for our modern society. But though it is short and simple, it leads us into the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith. Beautiful. I um, highly commend that book to anybody. So, uh, and also to say in the Jesus Prayer, whether it's that um, just a constant one or whether you set aside time, as you mentioned in the book. So um, you've also written The Inner Kingdom, Collected Works, and that's the first volume. I was wondering what were some of the most pressing questions you hope to address in The Inner Kingdom? And um, uh, perhaps you can tell us a bit about the forthcoming volumes, if there's any coming along. 
Yes, the inner kingdom appeared, oh, a long time ago, in the year 2000. <laughs> and the publishers, St. Vladimir's Seminary Press, saw it as the first volume of what they were pleased to call my uh, collected works. And they hoped that perhaps I would produce a volume every year. Mm -hmm. Well, those hopes have not been realized. <laughs> I have been engaged in lots of other tasks, and I'm alarmed to think how many years have passed. But I do now have a sequel, more or less ready. I'm just working on the revision of the texts for a second volume, assembling articles that I've written about the Trinity, about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the human person. I've chosen as the provisional title in the image of the Trinity. So that is very nearly ready to go to St. Vladimir's, if they're still interested, <laughs> which I hope they are, because evidently the sales of the inner kingdom have pleased them. So uh, a third volume, looking to the future, which I hope to work on, would probably uh, contain my different writings on the Jesus Prayer. I wrote a short piece on the Jesus Prayer, The Power of the Name, many years ago, but I've also written a number of more specialized articles, and I think that could make volume three. Well, that's enough for the moment. Marvelous. Whether I will live to produce volume four and five, I doubt, but I'll try my best. <laughs> Excellent. So um, just lastly then, um, you've written Orthodox Theology in the 21st Century. I was wondering, what do you think are some of the greatest challenges and opportunities for Orthodoxy today? Looking at the 19th century first, and indeed the 20th century, probably the chief question before Orthodox was, what is the church? What is the church shelf for? What does the church do which nobody and nothing else can do? What holds the church together in unity? Those, I think, were the leading questions during the 20th century for Orthodox theology. And in particular, the contacts that Orthodox were having with Western Christians in the movement for Christian unity put this um, issue, what is the church, to the forefront. Now, I believe there's been a certain shift of interest in all the question, what is the church, still remains important. And we must go on reflecting on this and writing about it. But probably the key question in the 21st century is, what is the human person? What do we mean by a human being? What do we mean by the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of God? What are the potentialities of our human personhood? What are its limits? What is our special vocation as human beings? These, I think, are the questions that we Orthodox and Western Christians, likewise, are addressing at the present moment. So I would see the key question for the 21st century as, what is the human person? What does it mean to be human? Do you think there are any um, particularly strong theologians that are dealing with those concerns now that you'd like to recommend for people? Or is it, does anybody come to me? Yes, among theologians from the fairly recent past, from the 20th century, I recommend particularly two Russians, 
George Florovsky, and recently there has been published an anthology of his writings, which I recommend. The second person who I would see as of particular importance in the 20th century is the Russian theologian Vladimir Losky, and here I think particularly of his classic work, The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church. They, of course, do not stand alone, particularly Father Dmitri Stanislavski. Coming on to the most important among the Orthodox is Greek, and that is John Zizioulas, who is titular Metropolitan of Pergamon. And he has written about both the Eucharist and the human person. Mm -hmm. And he's still very much alive, though he's some years older than I am, so perhaps we mustn't expect too many more books from him. But he is certainly, in my view, the greatest among living Orthodox theologians. On the Russian side, I see an important contribution being made by Hilarion Alfeyev, who is met a metropolitan in the Russian church. And he was indeed my pupil in Oxford. <laughs> uh, and I would see uh, him as one of the more creative and original uh, Russian theologians of today. Marvellous. Thank you for that, Your Eminence. And um, thank you very much for joining me to discuss your life and work. I greatly appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to talk to you.